The Gospel text for this Sunday, May 10th, is John chapter 14. Jesus has been preparing his disciples for his imminent departure. He's going someplace they cannot come. And he has also told them that he will suffer, that one of his disciples will betray him, and that they will all be scattered. So the disciples are confused and afraid, and that is the context that frames chapter 14 which is designed to reassure them. Here is a paraphrase of the passage that I found helpful. It gets at the message of reassurance that Jesus is trying to convey to his frightened followers. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Just keep listening to me, following my instruction, walking in the way. And we'll be together, I promise. In fact, our companionship will be even closer than it is now. Today, we walk side by side. But in the days to come, I will live in you and you in me. Today, you walk in my footsteps. But in the days to come, you will walk, so to speak, in my sandals, and I will walk in yours. You will be my body, my hands and feet and word for a world that needs healing and justice and good news. My friends, I'm not abandoning you. On the contrary, you and I will now be closer together than we've ever been before. I'm leaving, but we will still be together. Just keep going toward God in the way we've been traveling, for I am the way. I wondered how to capture this notion of the way, the path, the road in works of art. I thought of the words of Jeremiah 16, verse 6. This is what the Lord says, Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. Jesus is that good way but how to convey that image concretely. The only way to do it is to stick with it as a figure of speech. Jesus as a road, a path, the way on which we walk and in which we walk. I don't know about you, but I've been doing an awful lot of solitary walking during these days of the coronavirus. And one of the benefits of this walking is that I have really slowed down to appreciate the world around me, the endless variety of plant life, the curious bark of trees, each different in its kind, the manifold types of grasses here in Florida. This put me in mind of how often Jesus used the natural world to make a point. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He spoke of vineyards and different types of soil and fig trees and mustard seeds and so many other elements of the natural world that he had observed closely and loved. So I thought that maybe I would focus on how artists have treated the natural world in all its singular beauty. Jesus certainly drew lessons from it as he made his way during his itinerant life and used parables of the natural world to make clear his teachings about the way to live. So I'm going to follow his lead and will draw your attention to the way artists have observed and sought to capture the wonders of God's creation. One of the earliest artists to do so, to capture the singularity of plants and animals, was Albrecht Dürer, the German painter whose life spanned parts of the 15th and 16th centuries. Every day on my early morning walks, I've been greeted by innumerable rabbits, so I thought I had to show you this gorgeous watercolor of a hare by Dürer. Every single whisker, every bit of fur, 
the very gleam in the hare's eye has been captured with an attention so intense that you can almost feel the animal's breathing. You expect to see his little nose twitch any moment. And he brought the same kind of attention to a simple mound of grass. That kind of patient observation and study of the most everyday parts of the creation slows you down. And it makes me wonder why I live at such a hectic pace, trying to accomplish so many things, when simply regarding the handiwork of the creator can bring such peace and focus. I can almost hear Jesus saying, as he did to Martha, Darcy, Darcy, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Focus on me, not on your anxieties. One of my favorite nature studies by Dürer is of this little owl. He has such character, such presence, and seems so owlishly wise. And you can tell that Dürer was captivated by the colors of the wing of a bird known as a European roller. Yes, he had to have been observing a dead bird, but he was clearly so in awe of the rainbow of colors in the wing, the subtle gradations of color, the sheer beauty of the feathers, that I cannot believe he would have killed it himself. Rather, I think he pays the bird a tribute, a kind of homage, by capturing the wing in all its glory. So artists have shown us nature's beauty in the microcosm, but it takes landscape painting to capture the beauty of the macrocosm and to show us the way in, so to speak. Landscape painting as a genre first appeared in Northern Europe after the Reformation, when countries such as the Dutch Netherlands and Germany had broken from the Catholic Church and practiced a strict form of Protestantism which frowned on the creation of overtly Christian scenes. Jacob von Reisdale was a Dutchman from Harlem and pioneered in this genre. The sky itself, in all of its immensity and beauty, could now become the subject of a painting. And when you have had your fill, gazing at the myriad of colors that compose the clouds and the sky, you then gaze on the flat landscape of Holland, with its windmills and the sea in the distance, while the land is illuminated by brilliant patches of light. Our eye is led into those patches as we follow the lone figure on the road before us, making his way through the fields and towards the church in the distance. As you will see, many landscape artists employ the way, the road, the path, as a device to guide your eye into and through the picture. Notice also the tiny birds, which seem almost lost in the immensity of the surroundings. Kaspar David Friedrich inherited this northern tradition of landscape painting as a German trained in Denmark. He imbued the land and seascape with his own spiritual vision in this painting called The Monk by the Sea. As he said to artists, close your bodily eye so that you may see your picture first with the spiritual eye. Again, the sky dominates the canvas and its magnitude dwarfs the monk who faces out toward the restless sea while tiny gulls swoop overhead. The painting is over five feet long by more than three and a half feet high, so it is impressive and powerful in its austerity. We can't help but identify with the small figure of the monk, and yet the feeling that arises as I identify with him alone on the shore is one of exultation at the grandeur of the scene rather than a feeling of being overwhelmed by its immensity. 
John Constable, an Englishman, followed in the landscape tradition of the North, but brought his own sensibility to it. Surprisingly enough, it was this Englishman who would have a decisive influence on French art throughout the 1800s and into the 1900s. The so-called Barbizon School, the Impressionists, Van Gogh, and this after an 1824 showing of his works in Paris. The public went crazy over this painting, now famous, called the Hay Wain or the Hay Cart, originally called Landscape Noon to mark the time of day. It shows a cart for hauling hay in the process of fording a small stream in Constable's native and much loved Suffolk countryside. The subject is humble, anything but exalted, and it was this that struck the French artistic community as being so radical. This is one of what are known as Constable's six footers, several six foot paintings that he did for this show. And at that time, according to the Royal Academy, where Constable had trained as an artist, a painting as big as this was reserved for serious subjects, mythological, religious, or historical scenes, not a scene of a wagon crossing a river. The color also was a source of fascination to the French artists. In background landscapes that they had seen by the old masters, the trees and land were more brown and muddy, not this vivid, lively green. And they didn't have highlights of bright red, as are featured on the saddles of the horses. This is what landscape actually looked like. It was not some golden or sepia-colored idealization of it. The curator of the Louvre, having seen this painting in the 1824 show in Paris, declared that Constable was the messiah of landscape painting. It must gall the French today to think that an Englishman was the source behind all that was to come in France, the Barbizon School, the Impressionists, the Neo-Impressionists, Van Gogh, Cézanne, Monet, and all the rest. As natural and unaffected as the painting might seem, Constable had constructed it quite carefully. So that your eye moves from the beginning of the stream on the lower right around to the left as the stream curves, upwards along the bright patches of white of the house on the left, and then off through the trees into the curving contours of the clouds on the upper right. And the clouds painted by Constable are famous, even amongst meteorologists, as his work actually depicts clouds as they appear. Constable, in fact, had studied meteorology and was fascinated by cloud formations, filling pages and canvases with studies simply of clouds. You can see Constable's influence at work right here in this painting by Theodore Rousseau, one of the leaders of the Barbizon School, painting in the forest of Fontainebleau outside of Paris. There is only one tiny human figure receding into the background at the end of a path away, that draws our eye into the center of the painting. God's creation is the subject, the beauty of earth and sky and trees and rocks and grass. After Constable, artists drew inspiration directly from nature. French artists now gathered at Barbizon near the forest of Fontainebleau outside of Paris to follow Constable's ideas making nature the subject of their paintings. The Barbizon painters, in turn, influenced the next generation of painters, such as Camille Pissarro, known as the Dean of the Impressionists, due to his age and influence. Again, we are shown away into the woods, lovely, dark, and deep, as Robert Frost said. A small figure in a red hat reminiscent of the red saddles of Constable, awaits us at the foot of a tree. In 1873, Pissarro helped establish a group of 15 
aspiring artists who would come to be known as the Impressionists. Pissarro was at the center of the group, and he was the major encourager of all the others. Here Pissarro builds on the expressive brushwork of Constable and the Barbizon School to give us the feeling of dappled light and dense foliage. Again, the path before us, the way, draws us forward into the picture. America caught the landscape fever too, as we see in this lovely watercolor by Winslow Homer, depicting a ranger in the Adirondacks. Again, a lone individual like the monk surveys the majestic hills, valleys, forests, and rivers that stretch out for miles before his eyes. And since we mentioned Camille Pissarro a moment ago, the Dean of the Impressionists, so now we must also mention Vincent van Gogh, whom he knew well and influenced so much. When we see his work alongside Pissarro's, we can see the debt that Vincent owed him. How beautifully Vincent has crafted our way into the picture by the smooth, straight lines or strokes that highlight the path. Vincent loved to paint the natural world and turned to it more and more for solace as his mental health declined. We can see how the bright palette of Constable continued to have influence. Bright greens and yellows and blues enlivened by flashes of red flowers at the bottom of the picture. Of course, it is Vincent's brushwork here that draws our attention. The swirling movements of clouds, the wind bending the light green olive trees, and the wheat fields in the foreground the upward striving of the foliage of the tall cypresses. Here we feel all the vitality of creation, the breath of life itself, and the movement of the spirit sweeping over the landscape. And that paves the way for Andrew Wyeth's picture called Wind from the Sea. In this time of COVID-19, if you had to shelter at home, you could at least be inspired to look out the window as Wyeth did here, to the trees or the grass or the sky. Or if you didn't have a beautiful landscape, perhaps there was a path, a way your eye could follow out and away from your window, as Wyeth has pictured here with the double tracks over the ground. And at the very least, you could feel a breeze through the window as Wyeth did, as he watched it lift the curtains. Surely this is a mystical wind, a wind of the spirit, as you see the ends of the curtains disappear altogether into gossamer wisps of light. As Jesus told Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And we'll learn more about that next week.